This program is powered by the virtual dot show, making your offline events virtual. Ladies and gentlemen, the host of Web at Virtual, Dr. Plamen Rusev. Hello and welcome. It's such a pleasure to be back again at Webit Virtual and uh, to get together our global community for another challenging and wonderful meeting. This time with a special support from a friend. Before I say more, it's in unprecedented time and we, we've been so active during the past few months building more than ever before, more projects, uh, more events. We've been more together. And today, with the help of um, our partner, Milcom, we are making a new step ahead, adding a new layer of discussions where we shall be opening uh, a new challenging and um, a layer of opportunities around regulatory affairs, and how connectivity can help us build up further. Without further ado, I would like to introduce my uh, co-host and uh, dear, dear friend with me, Mr. Karim Lissina, who is Executive Vice President, Chief External Affairs Officer of Milcom. Karim was appointed Executive Vice President, Chief Ex uh, External Affairs Officer for Milcom in November 2020. In uh, this role, he oversees the group's government relations, regulatory affairs, corporate communications, and corporate responsibility functions. His focus is on developing and driving Milcom's global engagement to support business objectives and particular responsibility for special situations and reputation strategies. Karim, it is such a pleasure and honor to see you again. Uh, we're on both sides of the Atlantic even though we look like uh, just next to each other. Hi, Plamen, and it's great to see you. And uh, greetings from the beautiful Miami. Not so sunny today, but the sun is coming very soon. Greetings from very sunny Sofia on the other side of the Atlantic. And uh, absolute pleasure to have you with us, uh, Karim. And uh, thanks for becoming a co-host of um, this important and uh, hopefully impactful discussion we are going to be having today together with you we are hosting um, some of the brightest people particularly in regular in regulatory and the three of them have been uh, top regulators uh, one of them is still and the other two are now um, uh, respectively CEOs of a very large NGO and CEO of ICAM. now Karim if you allow me um, I will introduce our speakers now, so we start immediately with the questions. Go for it. Thanks. Miss Elena Estavillo. Elena is an expert in the digital ecosystem, competition regulation, gender and leadership, with special focus on exponential technologies, data and transformation that they generate in our society. Founder and CEO of the think tank Central Eye for the Society of Future and Associate Director of uh, Consultancy Aecum. Chairwoman and co-founder of uh, Conetats, a network of women leaders in the digital space that received the WSIS 2020 Champion Award. Such a pleasure to have you with us, Elena. Welcome to WebEx. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure for me to share this space with you today. It is true honor to have you with us, Elena. And I already see thousands of people uh, turning out for this uh, special edition powered by Milcom. We have our second guest who I would like to introduce, Brendan Carr, uh, Federal Com uh, Communication Commission. Commissioner Brendan Carr is the senior Republican of the Federal Communication Commission, and he served previously as agency's general counsel. Described by Axios as the FCC's 5G crusader, Carr uh, has led the FCC work to modernize its infrastructure rules and accelerate the build out of high-speed networks. His reforms 
cut billions of dollars in type in red tape, enabled the private sector to construct high speed networks in communities across the country and extended America's global leadership in 5G. Brendan, such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much. Well, thanks so much for having me. Really look forward to the panel and uh, learning myself from uh, the wise words that they're going to share. Happy to offer some of the experiences from the U.S. So uh, thank you to Webbit. Thank you to Kareem for the invitation. I first met Kareem uh, actually in Cartagena, uh, of all places, a couple of years ago. He's been such a great advocate uh, for policies uh, that are going to benefit the consumer. And I've, I've learned a lot in my job from him. Thank you so much, Brendan. That's, uh, that's very kind for saying, and we are definitely absolutely excited to have you uh, with us. And uh, I do agree with, uh, uh, in terms of, um, of um, Karim's placement in this whole ecosystem, and we are absolutely excited to have him as my co-host. And with all your permission, I would like to have uh, our third guest presented now, uh, Mr. Goran Marby, Internet Corporation of Assign Names and uh, Numbers former Director General of the Swedish Post and Telecom Authority, Chair of the Body of the European Regulators for Electronic Communications, Chair of the European Regulators Board for Postal Services, and a member of the Swedish Broadband Communication uh, Commission with uh, two decades of experience as a senior executive in the internet and technology sector. And as I mentioned, CEO of ICANN, Goran, such a pleasure to have you again with us at Webit. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and joining. Thank you. And I suddenly felt very old when you took a part of my CV. Um, Goran, I think that internet uh, makes things a little bit different. Uh, when I was reading your CV, I was thinking, hmm, all right, that's quite a thing that Goran has done so far. I would like to hear what he's telling us right now. So let's start the discussion. Thank you so much for joining, Karim. I would like to turn to you now with um, uh, all the questions we have with the global community ready to hear. Um, please, the floor is yours. Look, thanks a lot, uh, Blamen. It's great. You know, for me, it's an honor. One, because in my previous life, uh, these three people that have been working and regulating me, regulating my, my previous company, at and uh, but they were, some, as I say, some of the most brilliant mind I had the chance to work with. So look, let's turn it into the discussions because people are here to, uh, to listen from them, not from, uh, not from me. So the reality is this, we have been through a year and a half of uh, really different life. You know, COVID obviously changed uh, uh, all the things we have done. Uh, it changed the way we did it, uh, changed the way we approach business, changed the way we approach our relation with our customer, uh, for the companies, but also with the citizens, for the regulator. So I'm going to ask uh, the question in that sense. And we have people that are representing different sides of, uh, let's say, the Americas from Elena uh, in Mexico, uh, you know, Joran being in, uh, on the West Coast and uh, uh, Brandon being on the East Coast, but I know traveling all around uh, the U.S., so I'm going to start with Elena. What can we learn, Elena, from the, uh, the uh, crisis and how we have been able to react? And what are your four minutes, let's say like this, uh, main takeouts of, uh, uh, of the last 18 months? And the idea is to create the base for then start looking at the future because the aim of this discussion is really looking at uh, tomorrow and the next years uh, and not only looking at what happened. But I think it gives us a good framework to look at what happened. Thank you, Karim. Oh, indeed, this, this has been a lifetime experience but for all of us. And in my case, um, precisely this uh, Centro E, this think tank uh, that, I, that I founded was born in the pandemic and, and partly as a product of, of a very deep reflection on this experience. Uh, working to advance the digital, the technological transformation process, but in a responsible, ethical, <clears throat> and, and an inclusive way. A lesson I think that we, we have taken from the pandemic is that the inequalities in our societies make us very vulnerable. And the pandemic made evident, uh, we, we <laughs> tend to repeat it everywhere, that, 
of these no numerous divides that we have in our societies and which are particularly large in Latin America. And we're talking about economic and social divides according to gender, to income, to skills, age, uh, the region that we live in, the disabilities, and, and many other um, circumstances. It also showed that a digital divide impacts everything. It is a structural feature in our recovery capacities because the internet is an enabler of economic opportunities and also of human rights. Uh, so digital exclusion means economic and social exclusion. During the pandemic, digitalization has been a lifeline for many, a powerful tool for resilience, but only for a part of the population. But physical distancing, the digitalization of all activities uh, has been a possibility open only to those who are part of the digital world. In, in this health and economic crisis, the disconnected have been the most affected by the loss of jobs, the loss of income, and also they have been the most exposed to contagion and to deaths due to the need to do all of their activities in person. But the COVID crisis has been particularly costly for women in terms of employment and mainly formal employment in terms of income, uh, of violence also, uh, on access to health. And women, for example, are not getting back jobs as quickly as men. And so gender uh, gaps, gender divides have widened. It is clear then that for, to have more resilient economies and societies, we have to recover closing the divides. We cannot grow sustainably without equality and lasting and peaceful solutions that we want uh, to reach require a minimum level of justice, of equality. So uh, recuperation with quality means a complete renewal of traditional approaches. Uh, to understand that closing uh, the divides has to be sent a central component of the new reactivation strategies. And it means also other things that we have begun to understand. We need a completely new social contract. And also on the other hand, and another takeaway is that the pandemic has also shown that reality is complex. We have numerous interrelated factors that determine countries, regions are interrelated. Health, the economy, science, and politics in each country are influenced by what is done in other corners of the world. And economic, social, and technological phenomena are also related. So we need to study to understand complex systems in order to find effective solutions. Would be my, my, my you're raising some really strong points and you know what i love about the points you're just raising now is is really the widening because this is not only about mexico this is not only about latin america it's about everywhere because you know uh, digital distancing except in very few countries is a reality everywhere and i want to follow up on that one uh, with commissioner Carr because he's a well-known uh, traveler around the U.S. and focusing specifically on this. And, you know, if, uh, if you don't follow him yet, I will really tell you, you should follow his uh, social media account because he shows you really uh, how America is and the big difference between all the different sides of the U.S. Um, Brandon, what can, following up what uh, Elena has been doing and has been telling us, what can you take out of that and the main focus you have been having in the uh, uh, in the last 16 months where you have been really like a trailblazer uh, in talking about connectivity specifically rural area and connecting and connected yeah well thanks so much kareem for that i mean i'll uh at COVID. i mean as, as covid 19 uh swept across the globe across the u.s as stay-at-home recommendations came out virtually overnight so much of our lives shifted onto the internet whether it was educating our kids accessing telehealth, uh, working remotely, getting stuck in endless Zoom meetings, uh, everything we shifted online. And if you look just at the mobile data traffic in the U.S., for instance, it spiked about 20% virtually overnight. And 
20% may not sound like a lot in the abstract, but to put that in context, that's like taking eight months worth of expected traffic growth and loading it onto the network virtually overnight. And the networks here in the US, particularly on the mobile wireless side, uh, were resilient and strong. And in fact, actually saw some speed increases despite that you know, massive surge in usage. And we didn't see that globally, uh, consistently at least. There were some regulators in Europe, for instance, that had recommended that Netflix and other streaming entities start to downgrade the quality of their service because they were afraid that the continent's networks uh, could not handle that surge in capacity. Australia made similar uh, calls to you know, Netflix and other streamers. And so I think we were lucky in one sense in the US, which is that we had put policies in place over the last three to four years that greatly accelerated investment in the network and build out. And to put that in perspective, if you go back to 2016, the US built a total of 708 new cell sites in 2016. And that is effectively zero. You know, new infrastructure builds have been flatlining in the US. At that point in time, roughly 16 or 2017, it was taking us four years to build the same number of cell sites that China was building every single nine days. So we were just getting lapped when it came to infrastructure build out. And the reason why was because we had outdated infrastructure rules that meant it was too costly to build, particularly the small cells that you needed for 5G. Uh, and we were behind on the mid-band spectrum. So we got to work at the FCC. And we engaged in five or six really fundamental reforms to cut red tape and make it easier to put up new cell sites. We uh, pushed uh, a lot of spectrum out over the last couple of years as well. In those efforts paid substantial dividends. Internet speeds in the U.S. tripled for that period of time. We jumped ahead of 20 other countries when it came to uh, mobile download speeds. Um, and we obviously had a lot more Americans connected uh, when COVID-19 hit. And that was, you know, that was really a good thing. But we got to keep moving forward. And I think the most important lesson for me is um, there's two keys to a winning playbook, spectrum and infrastructure. And I think sometimes as regulators, we can get caught into sort of uh, endless discussions and debates and considerations, but we have to deliver reform on the infrastructure side. The networks and the rules that government are built out uh, in a 3G and 4G era simply weren't suited for 5G builds. We got to work and, and, and work on that. One last thing I'll sort of highlight as well is how do we fund and support these networks that we've all been talking about? It is critical uh, to so many aspects of our daily lives. And again, it costs trillions of dollars to support these networks. In the U.S., we have this mechanism called the Universal Service Fund. The way that operates is we put about a 30% charge on the telephone portion of the consumer's bill. We collect that 30% and it goes into a pot of about $10 billion. So every year we spend about $10 billion to bolster connectivity, to support build out in rural areas where there's no private sector business case. Uh, and that's been a great thing. But that 30% charge has been skyrocketing through the roof. Uh, it used to be 6%. It's on an unsustainable path. So we in the U.S. right now are wrestling with how do we create a long-term sustainable federal funding mechanism uh, to continue to build out these core projects. The idea that I've put forward and others have is to look to large all, it's the large technology companies that are making trillions of dollars in profit and revenue because of the investments from this $10 billion a year fund. And so my view is pretty simple. They should start contributing a fair share. By doing that, have a stable revenue stream so that we can continue to support uh, and expand the bills where in the U.S. we need to subsidize it because there's not population density in those areas to uh, have the private sector. Build. So I think funding mechanism, universal service programs is one of the most important things that we need to do going forward. And it's time for technology companies from Google to Facebook uh, to start putting in a fair share. And look, I think this is a great point for Flamen, uh, if you allow me the uh, a third little question, and then we move forward to you. So we ping pong, and I will 
we decided because this is the beauty of, uh, of working with Plamen. Is I think a brand absolutely new Karim. I just wanted to let you know that the discussion is picking up. We already have uh, over. 500 people with us and uh, um, let me tell you all of you it's live live from our boss studios in Sofia in Miami now so please don't be shy and shoot your questions Karim back to you okay no I think uh, Brandon is raising some great points and uh, and you know and, and I think it will uh, it will lead to our to the rest of our conversation but I want to move uh, I want to move now really to uh, your uh, you know he, he had a huge experience when he was the uh, head of Sweden remembering uh, uh, talking with him all the time about the great projects we're having to connect uh, uh, every else in, uh, in Sweden and wherever he's going to Sweden will be every time impressed with the quality of the network uh, but also by the incredible uh, connectivity wherever you are even in the little island in the middle of, uh, uh, of the north. But you know, now from that uh, job you moved into what uh, uh, let's say a niece or friend has been called the men who manage internet, <laughs> and uh, and I love it because uh, because very few people or only the uh, the really techie people knows about I can. But the reality is that you see exactly uh, what's going on, and you are the uh, you are the the the, 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 board, the player that really helps and see where the things are moving. So compared to what Evan and Brandon has been telling us, compared to behavior, what can you what can we learn from you? Uh, compared to the light 18 months. And then we are going to move on on the discussions on uh, what are the steps forward. I think Brandon really put something on the table that is interesting discussing. But let's start before, what can we learn from the 18 months that have passed? And what is your view as, uh, as uh, the man who controls the internet? By the way, it's not true. The ecosystem and the community control it, but you know, I just love that one. Jordan. First of all, I, I think everybody in the world should be very grateful for the fact that I can or our community doesn't control the internet. Uh, that's not what we do, and especially not me. Uh, it gives me, the, you know, just to explain what I can actually do then, is that every time anyone actually goes online on any system, any telephone, any PC, or anything else, you're hit by something we call identifiers. Actually, one of few things we don't have an acronym for. It's the IP address, it's the... Uh, Domain name, it's the, uh, and th these are what we call identifiers. All of that actually comes technically from ICANN, the organization. Uh, and, and when we distribute them for a private ecosystem with different parties making decisions, making sure that no one controls all the uh, identifiers on the internet. But it is what, what we do together with our technical partners, create the common language that makes it possible for devices to actually talk to each other technically. Because if computers were talking to, you know, have different languages and, and different identifiers, the internet would actually not physically work. But also remember that what Brandon was talking about is that the, the mobile operators, the, uh, the fixed operators and all of them is doing a very important job because what they do is actually make sure that there is something to connect to. And then we have the content providers in the world who actually puts out some contents on it, uh, which means that you actually have somewhere to go that is interesting or less interesting on the internet itself. And I, I, I was thinking, and thank you both. I mean, it was been very interesting. So I'm going to take it a little bit different angle on this one. Uh, I mean, first of all, I think that one of the things that I learned, we learned from this, was the system worked. When, when the world into, went into COVID mode, what happened was that the underlying technical parameters of the internet, when everybody's going online, just worked. Uh, and it, it, it means that the stability of the system that is, we, were, we didn't see breakdowns of the technology. We didn't see, uh, when so many users suddenly came up, uh, we didn't see anything that really failed from our perspective. And I think that is a, a fantastic message that this, this system that was set up so many years ago um, and, and was really a, you know, it was an engineering project in the beginning uh, was, was fundamentally designed in such a way it could take on so many internet users. That's, you know, given point in time. What we focused on was, of course, to make sure that the resiliency of the system continued. And we worked together with everybody in our ecosystem to make sure that we could figure out from a security standpoint, from a cyber security standpoint, the things that it continued to do as well. Uh, we built special systems to, to track some things that was happening. Um, one example is that you know that during 
in the beginning of, of the of, of the pandemic, there were many domain names registered around the world that would contain the word COVID COVID nineteen, and and in the beginning there was a lot of discussions about the misuse of them. So we actually built a system that that tracked them, and I think that in the in remembering back, I think it was like 80,000 domain names around the world that suddenly registered in, with using the word COVID-19. And we're not looking only in English or French or Latin script. We check that in many different languages and scripts. The through the system, we actually did check them. And I think we ended up with three or 400 of them. That's very few in a world with hundreds and millions of domain names that actually was fraudulent. And together in the ecosystem, uh, we were able to to take them off and make sure they couldn't provide harm. So, and, and the and another thing is that this, when I think that we are, the system we are sitting and talking in, it, uh, you know, I'm being in LA, being in Miami, Brandon, maybe in LA or in Washington, and then that we're all in different places around the world, it's called, and different parts of the continent. It's, it's something unique. And also this year, this last one and a half years has been a, a really a flood of innovation. And we have seen new technologies, new uh, new business formats, new ways of connect yourself to the internet. And one of the things I take back is that the underlying parameters that I'm happy to be a part of actually makes it possible for all this innovation on the internet, all this testing of, of new ways to do things. But the, the system as itself was so sustainable that you can test things, you can, you can innovate. And I think that's been a very, very important that the that this was not done in a sort of, and excuse me now, being an old regulator, done by a committee by government, because I don't think that the system would have been so successful. So I think there's a lot of good to learn uh, with all the things that you previous speaker talked about. There's been a lot of things that we learned that has been positive, because I think that without internet and the way it works and the way it's run, which is not by me, um, it's actually has been, Without that, I think that the COVID situation would have been much worse. So thank you, everybody who's been involved in this, because collectively, it's been a success. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your great comments, um, Joran. And I think really you nailed it. You, know, you nailed it because uh, this is exactly what we should remember, is that this is a community. And it is only when everybody in the community play a role all together that the community is able to grow. Uh, you know, and I think uh, uh, this is where we're going to focus, but I just want to give an example. You know, 18 months ago when everything started, the guy that is moderating uh, uh, this event with me, uh, Plamen, who was working on a physical event and et cetera, and we were talking about how we could organize a physical event uh, in Spain, by the way, a great event and et cetera. Yeah. Tell me, Karim, we have to <laughs> follow and we have to do the things differently because I cannot do it. A physical event anymore and it comes with the idea uh, of Wellit and he builds this incredible platform and at the beginning everybody looks at him and say wow this is strange it would never work and etc and when I think to it and kudos to you uh, uh, Plamen on this one when I think to it it has been hosting the food and agriculture organization uh, some climate events and etc for the United Nations connecting hundreds of thousands of people only in a year so this is exactly the innovation uh, uh, Jordan was talking uh, about, and I really want to, to kudos this, because if we are connected between five different countries today doing a live event and uh, they're displaying that to everybody, this is also thanks to people like you, Plamen. So the floor is you for Thank the you. question, but I really want to kudos you on this. No, that's very kind of you, Karin. Truly appreciate your generous words. And I do, I do really grateful, feel grateful for being able to bring these technologies together. And as Joran said, Actually, it works, and it works so well that for the past one year, uh, with the help of the technology, we have built on a on a backbone of of, um, of um, everything that we've assembled in initially. Um, we have managed to host over 500 heads of state and ministers and the top executives, and we were we were elaborating on discussions which were touching each and every area of a human life. And it's been, as you've rightfully mentioned, tens of thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of people and events from COP26 through United Nations Food Systems Summit and SDG Action Zone and the Global Festival of Action and, and um, events for empowerment and events for, for 
making sure we are on the right track. So thanks to technology that it was all of us together. That's why I've started that with, with these words that we've done much more than we've ever thought we can do in order to keep all of us, this community together and um, the technology is an enabler which we see now working. But again, back to what makes this technology possible. We're discussing today innovation and uh, we're discussing also how regulatory framework can help us advance. And the, the pandemic experience can be labeled as a truly global one. It, it, it affected daily life in all of its aspects. It forced governments to elaborate and implement unprecedented measures we're all aware of. The economic recuperation is a high priority we all share. Now, um, this is a question to all of our wonderful guests in this virtual studio. Can you briefly share what are the main takeaways and how this situation shaped the priorities of your organizations? And I see Elena next to me, so maybe Elena I could start first, ladies. Thank you, uh, Pamen. Yes, uh, it's a, a very interesting what, what you have said and also Karim, uh, that this that we are living is a big real life experiment for using technology. And we have seen that it works. It, it gets us um, uh, doing not only the same things that we did before, but new different things that we, uh, it was difficult to think about just a, a year, uh, two years ago. And we are also at a historic juncture. And I believe so firmly. We're, the response that we're giving to the pandemic can also serve to not only to relaunch the economy, but to provoke a new model of development, a new model of inclusion. Uh, if we have a strategic vision, uh, these sh short-term recovery actions that we have put in place can at the same time uh, follow or um, into being the first steps to build investments uh, for an inclusive recovery. And uh, also um, because recovery will not be real, will not be sustainable if it does not focus on reducing divides. Um, telecoms are strategic to support the digitalization of all activities, uh, but also a dynamic digital sector can help the recovery of the entire economy due to the multiplier effect that we know that a sector has as an engine of economic activity. Uh, we know that broadband penetration increases GDP, increases productivity, creates employment. And at the same time, having tailored strategies to close digital divides can also favor the closing of other divides, which would reinforce recovery in other areas that we are thinking about education, health, and employment. And that is why it is essential that digitalization strategies deliberately favor inclusion. Um, and in talking about Latin, uh, Latin America, digital inclusion would reduce device within our countries and uh, also would help to maintain competitiveness in relation to the rest of the world and the ability to attract investments that we need to uh, continue the deployment of networks and increasing capacities, technological adoption, and, and, with it, and with all of this, the creation of jobs and business opportunities. Um, and also, um, I, I think that it is very important that digitalization is central for the adoption of new technologies like artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, big data. And this can bring great benefits for, uh, for example, uh, small local governments, SMEs that, uh, that uh, are also part of uh, these groups of disconnected entities. And we have to make sure that digitalization works for everyone. 
Um, uh, that's why we need gender diversity perspective. They have to be present in national digitalization plans in multilateral collabor collaboration strategies. And we need to develop specific strategies for groups with particular circumstances, needs, and not, that's why we need not a single model of inclusion, not a single model of deployment of, of connectivity, with, but we have these tailored plans. And one with a gender scope, but also focusing on the elderly, for example, on indigenous populations, people with disabilities, et cetera. And, and I want to turn to the gender digital divide. I, I think that is, is, this is a big issue. Uh, which we must go to the cause of the maintain women disconnected, uh, which are not only income or lack of coverage, but are deeper, are specific and require focus attention. Uh, we need to work on affordability of services and devices, yes, for all the population, but uh, um, women are in, in, many, in all countries, uh, the, the more poor of the poor. So they may require direct financial support uh, directly to women to, to uh, 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 and headed by women and, and businesses of women. Uh, we need digital literacy, but also relevant content uh, about the needs and interests of women. And we have to tackle gendered online violence, which is also very, uh, it's a very important issue for gender inclusion. Um, digitalization strategies uh, must have this gender lens to ensure that women effectively take advantage of telecommunications as a tool for their economic and social inclusion. Uh, we don't want to be left with more unequal societies. And this is because we want a fairer world, but also because growth with inequality is not sustainable. And this is a main takeaway. Gender equality not only means benefits for women, for society, but also for the economy. We have increasing evidence of how women's participation drives productivity, profitability, and innovation, which is very important in this sector especially disruptive innovation. And, and not only in the perspective of products and markets, but also in the way of facing uncertainty, of facing change. Digitalization with a deliberate approach to closing the digital gender divide is why is arguably one of the most powerful tools we have to achieve the incorporation of women into our economies. And therefore, digital gender inclusion should be seen as an indispensable tool for recovery and to promote a virtuous circle of sustainable development for the long term. Thank you so much, Elena. And um, Karim, I'm sure that uh, following uh, your, by the, by the way, I suggest you all from our Webit community also go and subscribe for the Tigo newsletter. You will see how many initiatives uh, Karim personally is leading in terms of empowerment. Karim, um, maybe back to you and also to hear our other two speakers elaborating on, on this specific issue. I think, uh, I think Elena has raised a very strong issue. And you know, specific in the countries where we are, we see exactly the same analysis. And uh, this is why we have been trying to lead uh, efforts around uh, uh, what we call connectada, so you can connect, that you can reconnect. I think the United Nations have been showing some of those numbers and it's super important to focus on that one. Let me shuffle a little here and, uh, and move to Joran and then to Brandon. Uh, Joran, when you hear uh, the points uh, uh, that Elena has been raising uh, on the gender diversity side, but also the challenges uh, of connectivity, what can we learn uh, from, uh, from ICANN as a, as a person uh, experience, I saw my wife starting uh, um, an NGO during the, uh, during the pandemic, uh, going over and uh, taking her domain name, starting everything. And, you know, internet has been really the place that she has been able to develop. And like her, so many people uh, have been looking at internet into, in order to get to the in, in, 
international global supply chain and international community, something that 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it would have been impossible, uh, especially if you were in a, in a country that was not connected or interconnected to the, uh, to the richest part. What can we learn from this, uh, Joran? Because you are really, I, I think, uh, one of the, uh, the thermometer of, uh, uh, of that internet global activity. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you, Elena. I, so diversity is very important for, for me and for ICANN and from two aspects. One of them is that ICANN is, is something called a multi-stakeholder model or a bottom-up process where we engage people from thousands of people around the world um, from, who comes into ICANN and actually makes the decisions. Uh, governments has a place, academia has a place, businesses has a place, uh, operators has a place. Everybody comes to the table and actually discusses the technical parameters of the uh, of the internet and makes decisions. I don't make them. I, I my job is to make sure that those decisions gets uh, gets implemented, and and to be able to make sure that this model is sustainable, we have to have the diversity and in so many different dimensions. Anything from I mean, gender is one of those aspects. We need to have people from you know, all over the world uh, with different backgrounds, different narratives and the ability to have a voice. And, and we work very hard in ICANN to make sure that's possible. So the diversity is, is, is sort of a part of the DNA because if this was only made, decisions was only made by middle-aged men from Northern Europe, such as me, it would not be good decisions. The, 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 and just to mention my own organization, we are 400 people in, in ICANN uh, who works as ICANN staff. And we actually do speak 55 languages, and we are in 36 countries. And, and one of the reasons for we're doing that, and by the way, we have a little bit more women than men, uh, and the executive team is 50-50, uh, yes, by chance, uh, if you exclude me, by the way. Um, the, 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 the reasons why we internally also work with diversity questions from that perspective that we have people around the world is because the same thing, we will need to be able to support our community and, and, and we support the internet users of the world uh, so we actually do understand and language is one of them. So that's one of it. Uh, and, and thank you for bringing this up. The, the other part of this is actually, and now I'm going to be technically a little bit boring, hopefully it might be interesting. You might not think about this, but today when you go online, there are, and there, you are about 5 billion users today. I actually don't know how anyone actually calculates that. That's what people have been telling me. You only have about 1,500 ways to identify yourself. What do you mean now, you ask? Uh, for many users here, you have the, what, the, the big and broad ones like .com, but you also have your own local ones, the, what we call the country code operators. There's only about 1,500 of them. And if you look at them, most of them are primarily in a way that is very resemblance what we call Latin script. Um, and they are not as generic as you might think to. And one of the learnings from, from this is that we have to be able to provide new domain names, the abilities for people to identify yourself on the internet, the things that you're using for your emails, your identifiers, and all of that, the web pages you find. That is more than in Latin script where you have to read from left to right uh, with a dot in the middle. And I can right now, the ICANN community is working on to trying to address that. Because when the internet started, uh, with all this started many decades ago, uh, which is actually short term in, in technology, uh, we, the, the, this started as a research project. We didn't always think about how we're going to make sure people in Africa, Asia, Latin America and other ones could actually identify themselves. So we're working on a program, which is a very large program to expand uh, the, the ability for people to, to come up with new, what we call top level domain names, that is sort of targeted to groups that is not naturally going on the internet. You shouldn't be needing to read English or have an English uh, keyboard to be able to have your own identifiers. And I think that's a very inclusive project to be doing. Uh, from an ICANN standard, it's very large and it's going to take years to make it happen because we're actually, uh, do, when we do something, it affects the ability for internet users around the world. And I think that's an outcome of all this, to, to give people a chance to have, to build communities, also local communities, with their own script, their own keyboard, and most importantly, their own narrative on the internet as well. To make that happen as well, sorry? You're an, as a son of an Arabic... Uh... I'm a Tunisian woman. I want to thank you for that. 
And I want to thank you because specifically because local languages are essential because sometimes we have this idea that everything can be done in English and English is the language of, uh, of the internet. Uh, but the reality is that the more we are moving uh, into local languages and these projects that you're just telling us speak to my heart because the more we will be able to connect those people that don't have the chance to speak another language or simply don't have the possibility to learn it. So even if we see millennials and younger generations being more and more English fluent, I really want to thank you because I think that will be key for, uh, for bridging that, uh, that digital divide that we are seeing today. So sorry to interrupt you, but I really wanted to thank you. Which, which think that I think you're going to like my example that I was going to use because I can, and, and what we do cannot do this alone. We have to work with uh, software providers. We have to work with equipment providers and anyone else. And then one of the examples I sometimes use is that apparently less than 20% of all the email service in the world can read Arabic script. And that is what we're trying to address. Thank you very much. You see, that's perfect. And it was, look, as a transition. But I think this is a, a great point, and I want to, uh, to look at this. Uh, Brendan. You were talking about your idea, okay, of uh, involving more, let's say, the whole uh, ecosystem of the big players. What can we learn more as part of this uh, when we look at internet recovery? You know, you are doing it from a country where I have the chance and honor to live, uh, where connectivity is pretty impressive. You know, I, I can choose in my house two fiber connections. Uh, I have three incredible operators. Uh, giving you great speed and almost everywhere I am connected. But what can we learn that from the initiative uh, that you told us uh, in your first remark, um, looking at also the countries that have less capacity, lower, lower revenue per user, but also economic uh, complication, let's say like this, because of GDP growth, but also side of GDP and revenue per user being low. And I ask you to elaborate a little more about this because I think your proposal uh, has been getting a lot of interest in DC and I think uh, would get wider interest too. Yeah, well, thanks for the question. I've, I've been very pleased with the interest so far in DC on this idea, the progress that we're making towards it. I mean, look, each uh, country has its own unique challenges uh, and opportunities. In the US and our urban centers in particular, uh, suburban areas, uh, we have, you know, an awful lot of very high quality internet connections. 5G right now in the U.S. covers either 270 or 300 million people. So uh, the vast majority of our population have 5G already, but we still have lots of pockets of this country that are sparsely populated. And that makes it very, very difficult to justify a private sector bill. For instance, to run a mile of fiber, it can cost, you know, give or take about $25,000. If you're talking about parts of this country in the U.S. with one or two people per square mile, that private sector business case is never going to uh, pan out. In fact, the U.S. is probably most similar to Australia when it comes to population scarcity. So that's one area where uh, Europe has an advantage. But again, the challenge there in Europe is it tends to be historically much lower levels of investment in networks for a variety of reasons. And so the challenge in the U.S. is how do we at a federal level, create a subsidy system to ensure 5G and other high-speed builds in our rural communities. And in Europe, the challenge is if you want to get you know, 5G in every major city and beyond that, uh, there needs to be a sustainable funding model, South America as well, to do that because it's not clear um, that the market is going to justify the massive investments alone that the private sector needs. And so this funding model that I've spoken about is one that could address the U.S. issue with rural communities. And I think it could address meeting the challenge that European officials have put out of making sure that they are on uh, the front edge of 5G. And frankly, it has very historical roots. In the U.S., um, the way we subsidize network builds is that traditional enterprise businesses would pay the lion's share of the cost of the network. And they did that because they paid relatively higher prices for things like fax lines and 1-800 numbers and you know, business, uh, long distance calling. And so that would ultimately benefit the consumer, the business is paying more. Well, as communication shifted onto the internet, those legacy forms of communication, 
fax lines, uh, traditional style 1-800 services went away. And so the businesses that were benefiting from the network back then, you know, essentially stopped paying a fair share into the system. And today, the businesses, the analog to those traditional businesses are large tech companies. In the U.S., for instance, if you look just at the big streamer, so Disney, uh, Netflix, Hulu, they account for something like 75% of all downstream traffic on our rural networks and something like 90% of the cost of maintaining those networks. And yet it's the everyday consumer who is subsidizing those builds and therefore the existence of those networks through that 30% charge on their telephone bill that I talked about. And so my idea is effectively to go back to where we started, which is ask ourselves, what are the business enterprises that are benefiting from these networks and how do we get them to start paying a fair share once again? Uh, and so one way to do that that I've thrown out there in a targeted way is look at digital advertising revenues. So this is uh, Facebook and Google. It's a hundred plus billion dollar a year uh, industry and it's growing. And so we could take the 30% charge on Americans' telephone bills, bring that to zero and replace it with a seven or 8% charge on the digital advertising revenues of Facebook and Google. And I think it is an entirely fair way to uh, account for and allocate the needed infusion of extra dollars to get 5G and high-speed connections. And these businesses that are gonna be paying in this single digit percentage are also gonna benefit because they depend on those networks being there to reach their consumers. So I think it makes a, a lot of sense uh, as each country, each region of the world has different challenges. I think the common denominator is we need an infusion of federal dollars to fully bridge the digital divide and looking to large technology companies uh, that are making trillions of dollars off of these networks uh, to me is, is a common sense way forward. I think uh, the proposal is there, Plamen. How do you see this? Uh, you know, interesting uh, well, uh, plan. Yeah, I, I think we just we just um, we just have a, a news to share, <laughs> and um, it's uh, it's out there already, uh, spoken out by uh, by someone who is uh, in a position to make it happen. So um, I think that that definitely makes sense for most of the participants in the ecosystem. Those were these discussions going on for a while. So um, I would like to see what would be the next steps. But um, Karim, you were very, very straightforward and uh, pragmatic setting up this concept and format between Webit and, and Milcom. And <clears throat> we were looking at straightforward and very clear step-by-step uh, -step, um, action plans to implement. And uh, I want to go back a bit backwards to, to Joran and you're on to pledge Webit as uh, one of your communication partners for, for the project that you have described as um, identification of, of yourself. Uh, and um, I would love we to support uh, this whole process with a million and a half uh, uh, audience of Webit around the world and our community. And uh, uh, now with the news of uh, where we could go next, I would like to, to, to discuss the transition towards all these sorts of, of virtual environments for work, for education, for health, and uh, so on. So we realize how many things can be carried out digitally. And obviously there is already a, a model in place to be paid for. What are your takes on the role digitization will play in the near future in particularly Central and Latin America uh, where, where Milcom is, uh, is actively involved with the ecosystem. Uh, Elena, maybe to start with you again, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Clement. That, and uh, yes, and, and I love to, to talk about the specifics of uh, Latin America challenges. Um, our countries have been recording the lowest period of growth since uh, 1950. Uh, almost without uh, any economic expansion until before the pandemic. And this might mean that the prevailing economic approach in the region had reached a plateau. 
and, and maybe the growth potential and was already scarce. And this has um, um, multiplied the, the challenge with now with the pandemic. And one, fa one factor um, is a, a very high and widening productivity gap in relation to other countries and mainly to developed economies. And, and also a very unequal society in all of our countries with large economic and social divides. And on the other hand, but what is positive is that, that the region has advanced in connectivity in digitalization uh, with around 70% of the population regularly using the internet. And, and we could see the resilience of networks and of services all during the pandemic. And this, this is uh, the, the good part. Uh, but access, connectivity, connection, quality remain unequal. Uh, both uh, inside of our countries and within countries. And in addition, despite, despite the sustained improvement in connection speeds, uh, they remain well below the global average. And, and this limits also the type of services and applications that are, that are available. So uh, the push to digitalization, and well, there's a real push that we have been um, seeing in, in, this, uh, in this pandemic, it, it can lead to taking advantage of digital tools and to transform productive processes to boost, boost productivity. These changes have come around in, um, in many different activities, but again, not in an equal fashion. And incorporating emerging technologies such as advanced robotics, artificial intelligence, data analytics can favor productivity. So this can be a very important factor to move uh, this, uh, this factor that is so important for the development, for, for economic um, incentives, for investment and, and to create employment. And, but and digitalization is a multi-part task, uh, uh, this uh, way uh, to bring about changes have uh, to come from collab collaboration from different sectors. Um, it requires the participation of the public, private sectors, academia, the scientific community, as well as social organizations. And for this, collaboration is uh, fundamental. Yeah. The digital industry has the role, has the responsibility to invest and to extend network coverage at capacity, uh, driving widespread technology adoption. And also uh, being inclusive, it, 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 have, uh, it, it may have a wide coverage of the population in different regions to have affordable prices and accessible services, uh, accessible equipment. And, Companies also are understanding the needs of different groups, uh, but uh, we still uh, need uh, to, to see more offers of services, content, and devices that favor this inclusion. And, and uh, well, like, like Brandon has uh, very interestingly talked about, even the, the richest countries in the world require that the government act but where the market does not reach. In Latin America, we have also, we, we share these challenges, for example, uh, the, to have very sparse population in very wide areas. And we also uh, have uh, this additional um, challenge that we don't have so much resources, so much income per capita. Um, and but the efficiency and innovation of companies is needed is um, uh, to extend as much as possible the frontiers of the market in such a way as to minimize the margin of disconnected people of, and entities that need this access to public funding. And to this competition is essential. Um, Another important player for digitalization are businesses in general, uh, which will have to adopt technologies to process large amounts of information, 
So they can improve decision processes. They can redefine business models. And the industry also should incorporate greater use of robotics to improve efficiency and to increase the use of artificial intelligence tools. All of this can boost in, uh, productivity, which is such a, an urgent need in, in our region. And um, I have and to uh, talk about government as uh, a critical actor. They have a, a very uh, central role. And in the pandemic, um, many governments, federal, local, have exposed the public sector's deep digital gaps. Uh, numerous entities in the region were paralyzed. We, we have to say it right, by the lack of preparation in infrastructure in digital services, but also because of the rigidity of processes and of culture to adapt to the virtual ecosystem. And this is something that we also need to work on. Uh, but uh, it's true. And other entities have developed electronic procedures, remote work mechanisms. Others are strengthening their cybersecurity, but efforts remain very uneven uh, among countries and inside the same countries. Um, and it is also true that another part of the public sector is just hoping to get back to doing things that the way they used to. And we have uh, to avoid that. We, we have uh, to digitize, uh, to, to bring this digitization to the public sector. And entities responsible for the provision of essential public services for the population, such as education, health, and justice. And justice have an important role to play. Digital technologies can help restore uh, trust in public institutions. I, I think that this is very important, making them more credible, more efficient, innovative, uh, using uh, open government policies uh, to promote a culture of transparency, of access to information, and control over the use of public funds by citizens, uh, which is uh, very important. And digital, uh, digital tools can also help administrations to use uh, these new data sources and be more innovative in how they approach public policies and how they bring uh, public services to the popula population. And, and finally, uh, citizens, we as our citizens have to be conscious, have to be knowledgeable uh, digital users uh, to empower ourselves and uh, bring value to all these actions and bring value to all the digitalization of services um, of, of, of our lives in a way uh, that, uh, that lets us uh, uh, have better uh, um, uh, benefits that uh, come to our, our real needs and values as citizens. Amen. If you allow me, I Please, Karina. want as usual be disruptive because you know this is what we, we like and that's why I love you. But specifically because of the comments of Elena, I want to ask, very short, uh, but to Joran, Brennan, and Elena, some ideas, okay? I want to ask them a few things like, imagine, we hope COVID will be, at least the crisis will be done and you know, vaccination I will be able to reach uh, uh, the levels everywhere, specifically in our Latin America region. But what I would like to see uh, in this discussion is, is asking, uh, let's start with, uh, with Yora. In the next 12 months, 12, 18, what should we do uh, as industry, government, civil society? What should we do in order to continue this digitalization, but also to improve one of the most important things that we had and that we saw, connectivity? Uh, I think Elena really shared some of the key points. I really want to look at what can we do together? Because for me, the most beautiful thing of this crisis is that everybody worked together. 
And maybe it's my Italian side or my Tunisian side that will tell you that when it's a crisis is where people finally understand and start working together. But when we are out of the crisis, how can we ensure that, uh, uh, that this is, uh, is happening? And, uh, and I think we have a little issue with Europe. So let's, let's, let's start with Brandon. Uh, Brandon, why don't we, uh, what can we do together? You know, specifically, uh, you have been in the, in, the, in the public sector for so long and, 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 and I think public sector, thank you, you have been having a, a, a very forward looking approach. So what should we focus on in the next, uh, in the next month in a regional aspect, okay? Looking at the world Americas uh, and something that is deliverable. You know, something that we know we can make it. Well, I think we're at a critical point in the rollout of 5G. And I think for a lot of consumers, they might be uh, getting sort of tired of the hype around 5G and they're ready to actually see something delivered. And I think part of that is a, a mismatch in understanding about what 5G is. Um, the way I describe it to people is to think of it as a, as a technology platform that's going to solve pain points in your life that you don't even recognize as pain points today. And what I mean by that is to think back 10 years ago when we were on that shift from 3G to 4G. Think about how you exchanged money or transferred money back then, right? You had to actually walk to a physical brick and mortar bank. You had to stand in one of those rope lines. You had to use a pen to fill out a deposit slip. The pen was lashed to the table. It was always out of ink. Well, now, we have uh, Square, Venmo, and other apps right on our phone. And that was enabled by that shift to the 4G economy, by the app economy. Similarly, how do you get across town? Back in the day, you had to call up a cab or stand on the line. Uh, now we've got uh, Lyft, Uber, uh, Black Lane uh, right on our phone. So it was this platform that allowed innovators to build these things that if I were to describe to you in the 3G era, what is 4G going to mean? It would have been very difficult to do. And I think the way to conceive of 5G for consumers right now is to think of it in three buckets. Bucket one is everything that you do on your phone right now is going to be better and faster, but that's actually the least interesting part of the 5G network. So 4G was effectively a network built to power the smartphone. Um, and that was the most interesting of a 4G network, that's going to be the least interesting thing of 5G. The second bucket for 5G is, is in-home broadband, that we can now get more competition for high-speed service inside your home through 5G because it can finally give you the same type of performance and speeds that traditionally you might have needed a wired connection. The third bucket is the most interesting to me, which is this new wave of innovations, just like we saw with the app economy, but it's going to be different. Um, one application we're seeing there is virtual reality, augmented reality. So uh, I don't like going to the grocery store, but I have to eat. So I got to go to the grocery store and it's a pain. And right now we've got some online you know, ordering that you can do. But to me, it doesn't replicate the experience of being in a grocery store, right? You, you know your own grocery store. You know which way you like to walk down it. It stimulates in your mind things you want to buy. Well, imagine now that you have this 5G powered uh, virtual reality goggles you put on, you sit in your couch and you can be sort of transported virtually to your own grocery store with the aisles the way you remember it. You can grab stuff off the shelves, you know, pretend to put it in your little virtual grocery cart and they can be delivered directly to you. There's, there's all sorts of augmented reality, virtual reality applications that are going to solve pain points in your life that you don't even identify as such. And that's what 5G is going to mean. And I think over the next year, two year, three year, um, we're going to really start to kick into high gear to consume seeing what is special about 5G because we're still in early days. I know we've been talking about it for three or four years, but it's just getting built out and that new wave of innovations is still yet to come. So get the infrastructure built across the finish line. And then I think consumers are going to see some real uh, changes into their daily lives. I think, you know, your points are super well taken and let me apply them to Latin America. You were talking about all these great US companies, but you know, uh, we can talk about Mercado Libre uh, with, uh, let's, say the, let's call it the version of Amazon. We can talk about Clip with the second version of uh, Square. Uh, there are so many of the examples. Let me 
little of self-promotion. You know, you can talk about Tigo Money. Uh, that is our MFS uh, <laughs> we are launching. And why I'm saying this is because there is a revolution coming also in our region. And I think this is, for me, the, the brightest part uh, of what we see is that this crisis have also pushed a lot of digitalization and people had more opportunity because we were living in a world of a lot of cash. You know, the Google's, the Google's uh, shop thing, uh, uh, I imagine trying to do that in, uh, in Mexico, for example, a city, a Mexico city that I love in Puebla. But I think you will still have to replicate the smell. You know, my mother, <laughs> and a man that you have, my mother teach me that in order to buy something, you have to feel it and to smell it. If not, you cannot be sure that it's good. So that, that's the one that I will have. To <laughs> but let, let, let me shift to Joran and then to give back the floor to Flamen. But Joran, when you look at this, about this uh, big hype specific in the US and some European countries from 5G, I think our countries are probably going to learn from that and come on that with a uh, with few years uh, after. We are still uh, heavily deploying a uh, uh, 4G and putting a lot of capex there. But uh, when you see that uh, big change, what are the challenges that you see uh, for uh, for ICANN there? And then I'm going to ask a specific question to Plamen. So get ready, Plamen, because it's all about the uh, artificial intelligence. And this is your business. So I want to ask you that. I know it was not planned. But we'll go over uh, let's go, Joran. Thank you. I, 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 Karim, you know this story because I shared it so so many times because it's sort of a part of one of one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing. Many years ago, as a representative of the EU and Barrick, I was invited to Latin America uh, for for a meeting with several telecom regulators. And during a dinner, we had a conversation about you know internet and connectivity. And this country told me about that they were building what they called broadband to a village uh, project. And, and you know, I casually asked why. And, and that regulator told me something that, you know, because I always expect this answer that it's good for productivity, it will enhance, you know, unemployment or, you know, something. He said that one of the biggest differences for poor people in the world is access to information. And by bringing people online, you actually give the poor people the, ret- the, the same ability to get information as the, 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 the rich people. And, and I've been carrying that with me uh, as a lesson in everything I've done since then. Because it, it's, we often talk about the, the business aspect or the productivity aspect of things, but just to remember that half of the world still doesn't have internet. And, 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 and I think that's, that's something we all have to think about, regardless of the speed. I will not argue about the, I've been through 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. I was 30 years old before the first commercial text message actually were sent. And I remember sitting, working at the teleoperator at the time, discussing, why do people want to text each other when they can actually talk? Um, the world has moved on a long thing. A long, it's been a long time since that. One, one thing I, I, I really want to make sure when it comes to the implementation of 5G, and this is um, where, where I can make a stand, is that I believe, as, as I think Brandon believes as well, is that most users in the world will use some sort of, of wireless connectivity. Um, and, and here we talk about 5G, there are, of course, other ones as well, but the, and that's important. What is important for us and for me is that we still use the same underlying technology when it comes to making sure that people can connect. Because I don't think it's going to be very beneficial for the world if we sort of splinter the internet of having a separate internet for mobile users versus the ones who use it on a fixed line. And we all know that there are tendencies for that and technical proposals that can actually make it. So when you actually go online and you have your high-speed mobile telephone, the only thing you can reach is something that the operator has decided you can reach, which is against what I think the fundamental view on the internet itself. You should be able to reach anyone in the world with just your simplest device. Because I believe, and I think that most people in ICANN believe, is that the fact that you bring people online and can communicate, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how people will interact. I, I, just a couple of days ago, I was speaking to a journalist who told me that he was interviewing researchers around the world. And he told me, all the researchers said one thing. One of the reasons why COVID-19 vaccines were able to be developed so fast was the ability of researchers around the world, and some of them sitting at home, were able to communicate over the internet and to send large portions of data on the internet, regardless of the device or technology behind it. So they can really, really speed up the transition. 
Without the internet, I think that the vaccine would have been much slower. A lot of people made a lot of good for that. And I know to some extent it could even be a political debate. But I'm proud to say that one of the things I do is to make that possible. So the so I, I always think it's good for people to have connectivity. I always think it's good to have different ways of, of having that connectivity. Just make sure that it's one internet for everybody so we don't split it up because of different technologies. Thank you. I think these are <coughs> your points. And uh, so let's look at the artificial intelligence side that, uh, that were started by Brandon uh, Plamen. And, Give us a little of your framework as not only as the co-host today, but as an entrepreneur. Because I think what Joran said now is even probably more relevant in a world with artificial intelligence, uh, because you could imagine people cooperating together, uh, yeah, live through artificial intelligence. Uh, even if, as I say, I'm still missing my little lemon, but I will be happy, the smell of it, but I will be happy to give that up if we're able to sort a crisis like this. Uh, very soon. Amen. Yeah, smelling is not going to be an issue at all, but um, I would like to come back to what Brandon mentioned. It was so well said and, and, and Joran elaborated on it. So first of all, it's communication and it's, and it's connectivity. This is the key element of the opportunity for economic growth that we are talking about. As long as it's there, and as long as one, as Joran rightfully mentioned, not to have different tools for the same task, then we're on the same track and the right track and turns out the track works well. But what, uh, what, uh, what we were talking about, about the virtual reality, think about it. Now we are five people, uh, different slots in the world, and we are in this beautiful virtual reality, which is using the backbone of, of, of course of the connectivity and then the layers of the software that we have built during the past one year. With this software, we have made the first in the history of United Nations true 360 virtual reality experience, which hosted over 50,000 people, prime ministers, ministers, activists, all of them being together, discussing, and of course, exploring opportunities for building the desirable futures. Now, this is how powerful technology is. This is what we can do. And this was COVID effect. As you've rightfully mentioned, we were all supposed to get together in Spain, 15,000 people from all around the world, some of the best digerati, and then we had to do the opposite. We had to connect without being together. And here it is, it happened. And this platform now powers and many other platform powers. But now we talk about AI and you want me to talk about AI and I'm even more excited because it's because of AI, we are now in a position, of course, to do things that we haven't been able to do before. For example, there are algorithms. One of them is a prize Nobel winning algorithm called the marriage algorithm, which is basically matching people. That's why it's Nobel Prize winning. What we did, we took it and together with um, um, a great mind, neuroscientist Moron Cerf from Kellogg Management School, we have worked on it, algorithmics, which are now connecting people in a more meaningful way while being in a virtual reality together on our TVS platform, being uh, at events like this or anything else. And then we started matching people, not only on personal, but also business and both business and personal profiling, which enables them to build much stronger relations and celebrate connections. And this is only one of the thousands of implementations. But then let me tell you what Professor Braxton said uh, once at WebEx a couple of events back. And it reminded me of this uh, ancient Greek king who wanted to have something special, the ability that whatever he touches turns into gold. And then what happened is that once this came true, everything that he was touching was turning into gold, including his food. So we have to be very, very careful where we are aiming at when we look at the artificial intelligence and how far we want to go with our dreams and thoughts before 
we make sure that we really know that things we touch will be what we want them to be, not to turn into things we cannot use. But with all this said, um, I think our focus now today on um, um, how we how we 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 gonna use this transition towards all sorts of, of virtual environments is taking place. We already discussed, um, and there were some real interesting examples for um, how we can see this, you know, from a Latin America point of view. But let's let's see, and maybe this should be our final uh, final uh, question to all. What can digitization bring to unlock the true economic potential, the economic growth of the areas of the world, which are, we, we see the players um, um, that we are discussing now, particularly um, Central and Late America, and, and how we can empower all of them to participate in the process. Because I believe participation here is key, not observation, but participation. Participation. And, and if here I would like to start with, uh, with Brandon and yeah. hear your take on, on unlocking the economic potential through the digitization. Yeah, I, I think one of the most important verticals to focus on is telehealth. I think, you know, the power of, an, you know, a healthcare system obviously has so many knock-on benefits in terms of economic growth, economic opportunity. And, you know, we at the FCC have supported for years uh, connections to brick and mortar healthcare facilities. And that did real wonders. But one of the things I saw a couple of years ago, I was on a, a visit to the Mississippi Delta, spent time in a small town there called Ruleville. Uh, it's a place that sees diabetes at twice the national average, has high poverty rates. But it was a town that was doing an innovative pilot project where they sent this woman that I met, Miss Annie, who had diabetes, home with a iPad and a Bluetooth-enabled blood glucose monitor. Every morning, she would prick her finger and it would send her blood glucose level to the iPad. The iPad would give her instant feedback. Eat this today, don't eat this. Exercise this way, don't exercise this way. And she saw vast improvement. And it opened my eyes to this sort of new trend in telehealth that I've come to describe as the healthcare equivalent of shifting from blockbuster video to Netflix that you don't have to go to a physical brick and mortar facility anymore to receive high quality care. We have all these applications right on our tablets or smartphones. I think mental and behavioral health is a tremendous uh, opportunity there as well. I was in a remote uh, uh, Native American reservation in New Mexico and it's hundreds of miles to Albuquerque where you can get you know high quality mental and behavioral health specialists. But now with basically secure FaceTime videos, that care can be delivered directly into that community where it was unavailable before. So I think when we talk about the telehealth vertical that's gonna be powered by 5G and next gen applications, I think that's gonna be tremendously beneficial. Obviously it drives down the cost of care dramatically, it improves patients' outcome, and it keeps people healthy rather than waiting for them to get sick and end up in the emergency room, which is the highest uh, cost uh, section of the, uh, the healthcare industry. So I think the improvements we're gonna see from telehealth uh, that are going to come from greater connectivity is going to be one of the uh, most important lasting benefits, I think. Thank you so much, Brendan. Well, yes, yeah, so listening and, and knowing all these developments are, are so valuable for the population and health and education, access to justice. I believe that there is also very interesting applications uh, to, to bring uh, justice close to people. Um, and um, for all of this to, to come uh, in real life and to be accessible uh, to, uh, to all the population, um, collaboration, I think it's, it's very, very important. And I think um, at this moment of uh, the international adoption of this global tax for digital companies, it seems to me uh, that it points uh, to the direction uh, to this collaboration. Uh, it involves uh, not only in this specific uh, issue of taxes, but into um, collaborating, into adopting policies, 
that tra traditionally have remained uh, within the realm of national governments and for internal purposes. And these actions mean that there is a global consensus is building on that digital markets extend beyond national borders and that individual action, uh, even if it comes from the most powerful countries, has its limits. And I, I would love uh, to see, for example, this collaboration among uh, Latin American countries uh, that could benefit from that vision uh, to strengthen economic ties uh, between our countries and uh, create uh, regional digital initiatives and and to bring also collective intelligence because our countries share so much on and, and our challenges and circumstances and and a permanent permanent collaborative multilateral approach is required uh, on many digital issues and it can be scaled up to data flow to competition privacy cybersecurity. And cooperation is also required to bridge, again, the digital divide between um, uh, countries and between regions. Um, looking at national digital plans in, and the international debate, um, I, I see uh, three characteristics that I consider very necessary uh, for bringing about all uh, this uh, technological um, new applications and innovations uh, for real cases in Latin America. But first, uh, to be comprehensive and not only include coverage, but also affordability, uh, direct financial supports to families, to, to small businesses, uh, uh, to have actions for digital literacy, uh, to produce relevant content, uh, what we, you have talked about uh, on languages, how languages is important for inclusion. Um, and also for having uh, a very strong e-government, uh, cybersecurity, the, the gender perspective, and to bring, uh, to, uh, uh, to bring this uh, collaboration and perspective to widen uh, these actions to include artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, the 5G ecosystem, as well as scientific and educational preparedness that, that is also a very important factor. And uh, also and another characteristic is, is to be horizontal collaborative. Uh, digi digitalization cannot be achieved by the individual act or with a single vision. Um, we have to bring uh, to the table to different um, public entities like regulators and digital ministries, uh, public entities that provide essential services uh, that must be digitized, such as uh, uh, public education, health, public security. And uh, to have also collaboration within different levels of governments with states and municipalities, with the uh, private sector, social sector. And uh, finally, uh, to be inclusive and participatory. This, this is also very important. Uh, with this deliberate focus uh, on the device, on the elderly in rural areas, to, in indigenous peoples, regions and poor states, people with disabilities. It is not about having assistance interventions designed uh, by distant decision makers, but, but rather this participatory approach is uh, to include, uh, Joran has talked about it, to include women uh, and vulnerable groups, diversity, to actively be involved in building solutions. Uh, to participate in decision making, the execution of solutions. It has proven to be very successful in face of COVID and in general in leading in situations of uncertainty and rapid change. Uh, and this comprehensive, collaborative, participatory approach is the one that can achieve sustainable solutions for the long term, I believe. 
Thank I you. Think you we are looking Thank for you. Thank you very much. Ellen. Yeah, sorry, I think we have a delay. Uh, that's, a, that's a proof that we are live, right, Plamen? <laughs> we are. <laughs> um, I, Elena, you, you, you spoke out uh, uh, the, the mission statement of what we at Web at Believe, and it's been um, a real pleasure to, to listen to this in a, in a wrap from you um, after this almost hour and a half together with, uh, with all of you fantastic distinguished guests. Um, sorry, Karim, I, I hope now you are back online. Yeah, I'm there, I'm there. I'm there, don't worry. <laughs> all right. Great, but because I can't go without my co-host uh, today. Let, let's say like this. Let's use your run to have the last minute, and then I want, uh, and then we can close. But I cannot close, cannot close before uh, hearing from my Swedish uh, Los Angeles, because now it's more of an LA <laughs> than the <laughs> kid. Go for it, Joran. I mean, so many smart things have said, been said by people who are way smarter than me. But uh, so maybe I just want to do a little bit of a, of a thing. One thing that is a great concern to many around the world uh, in this digitized society is also the question about privacy. Um, and I, what I'm hearing from, from my community and many others is, is the question about the need for transparency, for instance, for law enforcement and others for getting access to data balanced with the rights of privacy for individuals. And I think that that is something that's going to be even more important in the discussions we just heard about the new business models and new ways. And, and I'm looking forward to, to have those discussions. We know that many places of the world is making legislations uh, and looking into it. But I also think when this is not an easy, I mean, in the world of the internet, this is not easy. Um, so, so I think that when we, it, it's a little bit like when you construct a car, you design the airbags, you know, when you actually design the car, you don't try to attach them later. And I think that we're going to go into not only because because regulators and legislators think so. I think it's going to be an increased customer demand, uh, with you know that you have to know, you want to know what happens with your personal data. And this is a, and I'm trying so much to stay it out of a political discussions uh, because I can is a non uh, political organization. I will never have opinions about legislations. That's not our role. We're we're all nerds and technical ones. But I think hearing from 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 different parts of the world, that is something that is front and center. But can I take the opportunity uh, also to say thank you for inviting me to this. It's been a very exciting, uh, very exciting and impressive event as you always set up, Karim. And I'm, I'm very honored to be here and I feel humbled of having uh, the other panelists and talking besides them. Thank you for, for that. You know, thanks to you. And you know, I will give uh, the floor to close, but this is not finished as I say, because I know Plamen wants to present one of the spectacular projects he's building and that I'm totally supporting. Uh, I want to thank uh, really everybody, but Plamen, let's close it here with the fireworks, uh, as I know you're able to do. <laughs> you're putting too much pressure on me, uh, my dear. <laughs> no, thank you so much for, <laughs> for doing yeah. this. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude for having uh, such a thoughtful and um, honest and open and at the same time, visionary discussion on where um, three, actually four of you um, see we should, we should go. And, and have in mind that we have a really strong representation of uh, um, regulatory people here, uh, both past and current. I think we are on the right way. We've heard some real um, and straightforward uh, statements and news um, including um, projects on self-identification. We were discussing on how to fund the next uh, step in, um, in, uh, in 5G and who should be the funders. We've been talking about things that are pretty much in the core and, and, uh, and the mission of WebEd when it comes to empowerment, sustainability, and resilience. Now, with this, um, again, a huge gratitude to all of you for being with us, um, giving um, uh, your thoughts and ideas and at the same time sharing them with the global community. I've seen at certain moment, we had over 7,400 concurrent attendees. It's that important for the global community and it's that important for all of us to have such discussions and hopefully to continue having them. My special gratitude to Karim and to the entire Milcom team, team for joining, supporting us 
as um, as uh, sponsors of, of WebEd and uh, and building this meaningful dialogue. Hopefully, looking forward to escalate this, dear Karim, and to build more in the future. And now, uh, just before um, we we bid uh, uh, goodbye, I just wanted to uh, remind the whole WebEd community of something we are all looking forward to. Over 70,000 people have already registered for our um, global um, impact week, which will take place between 14th and 18th of December. 12 hours per day agenda, over four, 500 speakers, some of the top heavyweights of the world when it comes to business, politics, and of course, innovation. The startup challenge, which is uh, currently bringing over 4,000 startups, um, special rooms for workshops. This is going to be a great place to be. And I look forward to meet all of you during these five days of uh, constant live events uh, brought together and um, making sure we pave the way ahead to the desirable future. See you on 14th, 18th of December. Thank you all so much. Karim, I would like to give the floor to you for the last words. And um, thank you again for being with us. Okay. Let's conclude by trying to summarize in a second. We heard it was all about collaboration, cooperation, ensuring transparency, and being sure that everybody takes his little part and work together in order to learn from the pandemic and to implement that, to connect those unconnected and to ensure that we are able to allow education, business to flourish, transparency uh, in how we make decision-making. There are so many to talk about, but I think I really want to thank Elena, Brennan and Yora, and you obviously, Plamen, for hosting this. And I thought everybody had a, a nice uh, listen to a discussion that was uh, forward-looking. And what we promise you is that we are going to have several more of those. And every time try to look at the follow-up. So, you know, Brandon raised a specific issue around telehealth. And I think that's an important discussion to really have and the conditions that we need to get there because this has been affecting all of us. Stay safe, be careful, pandemic is still there. But I also know that thanks to these kind of events, we're going to recuperate and go fast. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you all. See you soon.